G'day Gastromites and welcome to another edition of History of a Dish. Question, do you know who this guy is? Well, that was William Somerset Morham, a famous British playwright and novelist who quoted the following words. To eat well in England, you should have breakfast three times a day. And according to me, no truer words have ever been spoken. That's right people, today we're taking a look at the origins of the mighty full English breakfast. Let's go. <laughs> the full English breakfast, AKA the fry up, dates back all the way to the 13th century, which makes it one of the most traditional dishes in English history. Back then, a breakfast of this magnitude was often seen as a luxury and therefore only reserved for the richest in society. And during the Middle Ages, breakfast usually consisted of a mushy, gooey, thick kind of a porridge substance, or possibly even ale and bread. And if you were just a little bit better off in those times, you might have stretched that to some cheese, cold meats or even dripping. So the story of the English breakfast begins somewhere around the 14th century in the country houses of the English gentry. Now the gentry were an English institution who considered themselves to be the cultural heirs of the Anglo-Saxons and the guardians of the traditional English country lifestyle. In other words, they were fine folk and part of the upper class. The gentry were famous for their lavish breakfast feasts and the hospitality they provided for friends, relatives and visitors passing through. The idea of indulging in a full English breakfast in the morning before a long journey or before a rigid day of hunting was born during these times. It was basically a proper good feed that would keep the hunger away throughout the day and, as an added bonus, the gentry could show off their wealth in terms of the quality of the produce they had at hand. By the time Queen Victoria came to the throne, the gentry as a social class were in decline and a new wealthy class made up of merchants, industrialists and businessmen was emerging. The newly rich saw the idea of the gentry as the social model to follow and adopted the notion that the English breakfast was an important social event. Again, it was important for them to demonstrate how wealthy they were and what good tastes they had. Like many of the great Victorian traditions, the serving of the traditional English breakfast and its presentation was a refined and elegant affair, a civilized way to start the day. The Edwardian era can be described as the golden age of long leisurely breakfasts and garden parties, basking in the sun that never set on the British Empire. It was at this time leading up to the First World War that the English breakfast began to emerge as a standard in hotels and B&Bs throughout the land. The English breakfast was not just for the wealthy at this time, the middle class adopted it and brought it into their homes and it was soon being seen as a traditional family meal. They thought it would be a good idea to eat a sturdy breakfast that would see them through a full day's work. The tradition spread from the mill to the working class and reached its peak in the 1950s when about half of the British population began their mornings by eating a full English breakfast. By now, it had truly become a national dish serving every social class. Greasy Spoon Cafe started popping up in industrial estates, close to the ports and industrial centres, basically anywhere where the workers were. For a long time, these were the best places to get a real English breakfast. One cooked and served by real English working class people. Nowadays, the full English breakfast is a standardized meal consisting of back bacon, eggs, British sausage, baked beans, fried tomato, fried mushrooms, black pudding, fried and toasted bread. But back in the day, the traditional English breakfast could have had a few weirder twists, such as baked halibut steaks, fried whiting, stewed figs, pheasant legs, pork crackling, bone marrow, collared tongue, kidneys on toast, pig's cheek, melting pork pie, and a huge pork chop. Now, that's what I would call a true English breakfast feast. So, rounding up, I reckon it's worth mentioning that this dish can be enjoyed at any time of the day, be it breakfast, brunch, lunch, or dinner. And should you end up on a table where an English breakfast has just been served, it is culturally acceptable to ignore the other occupants of the table whilst reading your newspaper. Do not be offended by this, as a true English gentleman needs to be well read and up to date with the current affairs. 
Thank you for taking the time to watch this edition of History of a Dish. I hope you enjoyed yourself and if you did actually learn something, then consider tapping that subscription button and tag along for the ride. Until next time, take care.